the white shirt of Real Madrid, worn by some of the game's most magical names, representing one of the biggest and most successful football clubs in the world. Today, their fame is self-perpetuating, but it is due in no small part to the players of the 50s and 60s, players who were champions of Europe for five consecutive years. The Santiago Bernabeu, Real Madrid's home since December 1947. It is one of football's most famous stadiums, housing one of its most famous teams. But this was not always so. Many fans won't know this, but Real Madrid were on the verge of going down to the second division. For a joke, the fans at the time used to say we have a first division stadium and a second division team. In 1955, the stadium was renamed in honor of the club president at the time, Santiago Bernabeu Yeste, and the dynasty was born. Santiago Bernabeu was a really incredible president. He had an extraordinary talent, an incredible vision for signing quality players. Real Madrid possessed a genius in the shape of its president. He saw the chance to create a great team. A former striker and manager of the club, Bernabeu became president in 1943, and arguably his biggest contribution was the acquisition of one particular player, Alfredo Di Stefano. I was going to play in Europe, and I was all set to join Barcelona for certain, because they'd spoken to me first. But circumstances changed, and I signed for Real Madrid. In 1953, the highly rated Argentine was playing for Colombian club Millonarios. A tug of war with Barcelona ensued, but Bernabeu's persistence eventually won through. I was lucky enough to play in a good team. So the Arrow, that's my nickname, had arrived. And when we made new signings, we made up a very good, very strong side. A year later, Real Madrid won their first Spanish league title for 21 seasons. Los Blancos were on the rise, and Di Stefano was the central figure. He was a striker, a midfielder, and a defender. Technically, he was world-class, and the speed he had was impressive, and he just loved scoring goals. Francisco Hanto had also arrived from Racing Santander. The winger would become another club legend. Paco Hento was our quickest player. When a defender had to mark him, he just couldn't. When Hento was in full flow, he'd stop for half a meter. So would the defender, and then he'd be off again. The league title was retained in 1955, but during the campaign, Uruguayan coach Enrique Fernandez resigned and was replaced by Jose Villalonga. Villalonga was a coach when I joined Madrid. He was a military man and a fitness trainer. In 1955, Real Madrid contested the Latin Cup, a tournament for the champions of Spain, France, Italy and Portugal. They met French club Stade de Reims in the final in Paris. Argentine striker Hector Real scored both goals in a 2-0 win to claim the trophy for Real. A bigger prize, though, lay ahead. 
The presidents of several clubs held a meeting with the editorial department of the newspaper L'Equipe, which is based in Paris. In that meeting, they decided that instead of the Latin Cup being contested by just one, two, three or four teams, all teams in Europe should take part, and that's when it was born. The tournament was named the European Champion Clubs Cup and began in 1955. Real Madrid reached the semi-finals and faced Milan of Italy. Real Madrid really went for it. Our game was based on hard work and we were a solid team. And we were always convinced we would win. Such confidence helped Madrid to defeat the formidable Italians 5-4 over two legs, including this 4-2 home victory in front of 130,000. So Real Madrid would contest the inaugural European Cup final on the 13th of June 1956 against familiar foes Stade de Reims at the Parc des Princes, scene of their Latin Cup triumph the year before. Madrid fell two goals behind inside the first 10 minutes, but Di Stefano and then Real established parity before the break. Second half strikes from Marquitos and Real again ultimately produced a 4-3 victory. History had been made. Real Madrid were, officially, the first champions of Europe. The repercussions of such a sporting success had an influence on the social and economic aspects of a country led by Franco's dictatorship. It was hugely important in all aspects and across the whole of Spain. Nowhere more so than back in the Spanish capital where a hero's welcome awaited. People were lining the street from the airport waiting for us. We were driven past the fans in open-top cars and they applauded us. For Bernabeu, this was just the beginning. He immediately signed Raymond Coppa from Reims following his impressive performances against Real Madrid. The team were getting better and better. We had to strengthen, because the others in Europe were bolstering their squads. Copa soon became a favourite in Madrid, and the new season also marked the first team debut of a youngster who had progressed through the club ranks, Juan Santi Esteban. Many times in the dressing room, I used to look around me and think about who I was seeing in front of me. I told myself, one day I'm going to enjoy the fame that these players have and play as well as they can. Santi Esteban helped Madrid defeat Manchester United 5-3 on aggregate in the semi-finals of the European Cup. And the 1957 final would be held in reassuring surroundings. The Santiago Bernabeu hosted the final that year Home advantage ensured the holders were favourites to defend their title against Fiorentina of Italy. Real Madrid couldn't cope with the demand for tickets, and Mingote, a great caricaturist who died recently, sketched a wizard saying, ask me for anything you want, apart from a ticket for Real Madrid and Fiorentina. Spanish head of state Francisco Franco was among a crowd of 124,000. The game remained goalless until half-time, despite the holders' best efforts. But with 20 minutes remaining, Real Madrid's Enrique Mateos was fouled in the penalty area. Alfredo Di Stefano made expected use of the resulting penalty. With Italian resistance finally broken, Paco Hento doubled the advantage. And watching from the stands, a new signing was impressed.
I think the result was very positive and fully deserved. At the same time, it left an impression on me because I realized I joined a team that was full of winners. So much so, I realized I'd have to suffer and put in some hard work to justify my signing. Well, things turned out well, and I'm still here. <laughs> That same season, Madrid regained the Spanish league title and were host to the final edition of the Latin Cup. They overpowered Milan 5-1 in their semi-final, with Hento scoring a hat-trick. In the final, they met Portuguese champions Benfica. Di Stefano scored the only goal. At the time, it was an important tournament, but only the Latin countries took part in it. And it was a battle because Real Madrid were desperate to win it, and the rest wanted to beat us. So there was a rivalry and a chance to be the best. But shortly afterwards, manager Jose Villalonga fell out with Bernabeu who replaced him with the Argentine Luis Carniglia from the French champions Nice. The following season, after demolishing Belgian champions Antwerp 8-1 over two legs, Madrid eliminated Sevilla 10-2 on aggregate in the quarterfinals, including this 8-0 annihilation at the Bernabeu. We won 8-0, playing superbly, and we had some fantastic players. It was a game never to be forgotten because of what it stood for, with a view to the future. It gave us the confidence to keep on going. Madrid confronted Milan in the European Cup final in Brussels shortly after keeping their Spanish league title. The best of all was against Milan, which was a very tough and difficult game. That's because Milan had become stronger, thanks to the arrival of some quality players. Milan had a great team. I remember the player I marked called Grillo, an Argentine. He was a fantastic player. They had a host of very good players and were just a fantastic team. Four goals were shared over 90 minutes. For the first time, the European Cup would be decided in extra time. We won 3-2 after extra time, thanks to a goal by Hento. It was an end-to-end -end game and could have been won by either side. It was another of those satisfying moments which we enjoyed on a regular basis. But Milan could easily have beaten us as well. The citizens of the Spanish capital were used to political upheavals, but few foresaw how the Hungarian Revolution of 1956 would affect Real Madrid. Around 200,000 Hungarians fled their homeland, among them Ferenc Puskas, who'd impressed for club, Honved and country during the 1950s. But they weren't allowed to play there, of course, because they were banned. So he came here, overweight. Ferenc Puskas came to Real Madrid, aged 31, and was 12 kilos overweight. The coach, Luis Carniglia, saw him and told Santiago Bernabeu and Antonio Calderon, the club treasurer, he's a lost cause, so I'm not picking him. Bernabeu replied, your job is to get him fit, make him lose weight, that's what you have to do. And don't mention the subject to me again, we want him. He spent three months here without playing. He trained and trained until he eventually got in the team. As soon as he did, he showed his talent and his reputation as a top-class player. Everybody said he was overweight, carrying excess. Well, from being a fatty, he turned out to be a phenomenon. He was a key player for our team and someone who'd shoot from a long way out, 30 to 35 meters, and score. With Puskas excelling, Real Madrid reached the semi-finals of the European Cup for the fourth successive season. Their president had been a motivator. When that season got underway, Santiago Bernabeu said to the players, 
If you win the European Cup for the fourth time, it will be a tremendous achievement. But I don't think you're capable of winning it four times in a row. They met local rivals Atletico Madrid in the semi-final, which finished 2-2 on aggregate. A playoff was held in neutral Zaragoza. It was a rivalry between two teams from Madrid. Each wanted the bragging rights that were at stake. Neither wanted to lose face, especially because they were up against a team from the same city. Half time settled the tie. The feeling was one of complete relief because the pressure of having to win was so strong that you were thinking about the game two weeks in advance. Once it was played and we got through, we took a rest mentally, and that allowed us to prepare ourselves for another final. This time Madrid travelled to Stuttgart in West Germany, where they once again met old adversaries Reims. A healthy but friendly rivalry had been established between Reims and Real Madrid. But Real Madrid were the finished article. We worked hard and we were confident we'd win. There was never any overconfidence, though. Four years earlier, Madrid had been two down after ten minutes against the same opponents. This time, however, Enrique Mateos put Madrid ahead in the first minute. Alfredo Di Stefano doubled the lead in the second half to ensure the trophy stayed at the Bernabeu, the biggest possible consolation for relinquishing the league title to arch-rivals Barcelona. It sunk in that we'd won the trophy four years running, but we never thought we'd have the chance to win a fifth. Albeit with a new manager, former captain Miguel Munoz had been appointed. The decision was questioned in some quarters, since he had retired from playing only the season before. In the meeting they had, in Alfredo de Stefano's house, Santiago Bernabeu asked him, what do you think if Miguel Munoz took charge of the team? He replied, Santiago, you never know. He's a homegrown product, someone who's played for the club. So it's worth a try. Despite managerial changes, Madrid once again qualified for the semi-finals of the European Cup, scoring 18 goals in the two ties that took them there. Awaiting them were the reigning Spanish champions and their... I hadn't played yet for Real Madrid. How did I feel? Of course, I was nervous, but I was happy because, after all, it was a European Cup semi-final against Barcelona. Two goals from Di Stefano and one from Puskas gave Madrid a 3-1 win in the first leg, played at home. It was hard for us. But I do think that we had the best team in the world, by a long way. And that's what the results showed. At the Camp Nou, Munoz looked on as his all-conquering players won the second leg by the same scoreline to reach the final for the fifth year in a row. It seemed that everyone wanted us to lose. Well, not the Madrid supporters, but the rest were really desperate for us to lose so that our winning streak would finally come to an end. The fifth European Cup final was to be played in Glasgow. Madrid's challengers would be Eintracht Frankfurt of West Germany, a team that had slaughtered Rangers of Scotland 12-4 on Ag. I think it was the game in which we were under the greatest pressure. We were getting on a bit, we were getting older, and the Germans were younger than us. They'd just enjoyed a great season, so they arrived convinced that they would beat us. Real Madrid's team that day will never be forgotten. They had a three-man back line and two designated midfielders. Di Stefano deployed just behind the front pair of Del Sol and Puskas surged ceaselessly up and down the field, 
but it was the Germans who took the initiative. They took the lead with a move in my area of the pitch. The right winger made a run. From there, we began to think, we won behind and we better get our act together. These are extremely dangerous. The Germans scored first and were leading 1-0. Then one of their shots hit the post, and that would have put them two up. But in the end, we fought back. And we went on to score all those goals against them. That goal cost them the title. We reacted and just hammered them, scoring one goal after another, and it could have been more. Di Stefano and Puskas both scored twice as Real Madrid forged a 4-1 lead. It wasn't easy. They weren't a team with a big reputation, but they were like any German team. We had to get at them because we knew they never gave up. We had a big lead, but that aside, what we really wanted was to humiliate them. We did that all right and enthralled the football world. Puska scored four, Di Stefano three. The result? Real Madrid 7, Eintracht Frankfurt 3. He scored four, I scored a hat-trick. He beat me by one. He was amazing. That game's gone down in history because ten goals were scored. 7-3 in a final, and that's a lot of goals. I don't think 10 goals will be scored ever again in the final of a European Cup. I really don't. Nothing's impossible in football apart from that. As European champions, Real Madrid then met the champions of South America, Peñarol of Uruguay, in the inaugural inter. of representing a continent, not just Spain, but a continent, Europe. The first leg in Montevideo finished goalless, but the second leg in Madrid was a quite different story. After 10 minutes, we were winning 3-0, and we also hit the post three times. That told us that we were going to win the game. We won, and won convincingly. 5-1 in fact, a result that made Real Madrid football's first club world champions. It proved that we were the best team in the world. We had a fantastic team. But we were all getting older. Alfredo was getting older. Others were as well. Of course, even their glory had to fade. The following season, Barcelona extracted revenge by eliminating the five-time champions 4-3 on aggregate in the first round. But refereeing decisions in the second leg made it a bitter exit. An English friend of ours did us no favors at all. He made mistakes in all his decisions. That's the truth. But that's football for you. I think it was decided behind the scenes that Real Madrid shouldn't win another European Cup. That was the case. So there was definitely something going on. continued to reverberate through the lore of the game. From 1954... 
united after the problems the country had suffered back then. There was none of that jealousy that generally seems to exist in teams like, I think I'm better than you, or you think you're better than him. No, not at all. Every single one of us was aware of our own individual abilities and those of our teammates. I was the eldest of them all. But there were lots of leaders in the team. You don't get anywhere with just one leader. We had a leader in defence, one in midfield, and one up front. It's only now that you realise what impact playing in that final has had. It's only now you become aware that winning the European Cup is the ultimate. Sadly, most of them are no longer with us, but their achievements will live as long as football. Real Madrid, the archetypal champions.